Thanks, uh, thanks to Prakmak for organizing this event, and thanks to everyone for being here. Uh, I want to give you a flavor of uh, how Uber has grown, both in business and in the technology platform side, and what sort of challenges we faced, and like how we deal with it. Uh, Uber as a business and as a concept, uh, we finished uh, 10 plus billion trips earlier this year in June. Uh, we do about 15 million trips per day, six continents, 65 countries, and 600 plus cities. And this is uh, mostly Uber, just the rides. And we have 75 million active monthly users, uh, 3 million active drivers around the world, 16,000 employees worldwide, with about 3,000 developers. As you can see, we do have a lot of operations folks in, addi in addition to developers around the world. Uh, that's a pretty cool animation, actually also by one of our open source teams, uh, which uh, open sources a lot of visualization. Uh, it shows uh, how we have grown from the first, when we started, all the way up to a 10 million trips around the world. The much better, higher clarity version is on the Uber website. Just to dive into that animation that we've seen, this is sort of the definition of a hockey stick, almost a hockey stick growth that you can see. And we've grown from like, you know, a long time to a billion trips to doubling pretty quickly over time. And this, uh, one of the important aspects of it is this is just the rider's business. We have a lot more uh, platforms that are coming online with Uber Eats, Uber Freight, flying taxis pretty soon. So Uber as a technology platform enables development of all of these other business lines without having to retool the underlying platform that we built. And that's very key to growth of our other market segments over time. What is this uh, business supported by? We have thousands of microservices, thousands of builds per day, and more than 10,000 deployments per day. And this is across uh, multiple data centers with many clusters, and each of these clusters run more than 100,000 service containers. And I specifically mentioned service containers because we actually also run a lot of batch jobs and data jobs, and those actually we launch about a million batch containers per day. I want to give you a flavor of each of the phases of the DevOps and like samples of what challenges we have faced and how we solve them. This is definitely not going to be an exhaustive Think of all that happens at Uber. Uber is a pretty big, complex engineering organization already. So this, this sort of tells you a flavor of like you no know, type of challenges we face in e each of these phases. For example, if you look at the code, we started out with uh, PHP that was built by outsourced contractors, and the product market fit was so great which is an important thing to remember for startups and companies. It's like, it really doesn't matter what you build it in. If the product market fit is there, like you can scale the technology after that. Uh, Marketplace, which is our main uh, riders and drivers, that is actually was, was actually written in Node.js initially, and it is moving to go. Uh, Core Services, which is a technology platform for the applications, was written in Python, and it's moving to go in Java. Uh, Maps, which uh, serve a large part of the Uber customer base, but not all of the Uber customer base. We do use OpenStreetMaps and Google Maps and other locations. Uh, that actually is in Python and Java. We have a large data organization, as you can imagine, where all of the things that we do, all of the things that riders and drivers and Uber Eats and everything actually get stored in data platform. We derive a lot of insights from it, do a lot of machine learning across the company in every group. And all of that is also driven off by the data platform. Our metrics platform, we have actually open sourced it. I'll talk a little bit more about it later, is in Go. What is the reason I'm giving you a flavor of all these different uh, aspects of code is what does that result in? We have about 20,000 repos. We started out with some of the, U, some of the groups doing mono repos, went to like distributed repos, then some of them went back to mono repos. And there's actually a talk uh, by the mobile group on how they went back and forth between the mono repos to a lot of distributed repos and what are the challenges that happen. It's, uh, it's up in, uh, I think, on YouTube. Uh, right now, we have what we call as mega repos. 
the Android and iOS are actually in a monorepo. We are working towards getting maybe each language framework into a monorepo. There's a lot of different challenges that happen with uh, so many repositories at scale. We have multiple languages and frameworks, and this is key because when you actually write services in different languages and they're trying to communicate with each other, there's a lot of complex problems that happen. I'll go through some of those later, including what sort of channels do you use for communication? We end up actually having multiple wire protocols, communication frameworks, even libraries, and how do you start and stop a web service, a lot of these frameworks. We have multiple in the company, and we sort of have to advance all of these frameworks in each language to make sure they keep up to date to avoid tech debt. And that is really important with code. Uh, we use Thrift, we use gRPC, we use our own internally built protocol called T-Channel. Uh, we are trying to standardize on one, but you know, as many people know, tech debt is not easy to pay off. <laughs> We, uh, Uber decided on uh, microservices uh, a few years ago, and we went all in. So there's, there's reasons for happiness here, because we don't have too much older legacy things like VMs and those sort of things to deal with. We are all in microservices and containers. But this is a picture like about March 2016. This is what it looks like today. It's beautiful. <laughs> The picture is beautiful, but the complexity is pretty, pretty difficult to handle. So this actually, no, no single person can actually draw this picture. This was actually based on real-time communication that happens between the microservices that we actually got back from the metrics that we collect. And this actually, I'll come back to this later in the talk on how this complexity affects a lot of the design and decisions and our velocity and all these things. And as you can see, the growth, uh, there's no numbers on it, but we are about 3,000 microservices now. So all of these microservices, there's all the teams that are working on it. And as you can see, by the way, 3,000 developers, 3,000 microservices. So it's pretty close to a microservice per developer as of now. So all of these services are pretty continuously being built and released. So we are doing 4,000 plus builds per day using our build system. And when we do so many builds, each of these builds, while you're sitting there and waiting for this build to complete, it affects developer productivity. And then the actual build sizes that result, a lot of the you know, build sizes go anywhere from a few tens of megs all the way to gigabytes. All of this affects how fast you can, how quickly you can deploy, especially across multiple data centers, multiple regions, multiple clouds even. So we actually are in multiple clouds, too. So we set out to solve this problem. And one of the first things we realized was we are building containers and microservices. And Docker Bill wasn't cutting it, out, cutting it for us anymore. We both had to solve some technical issues and also scaling challenges. Technical issues with respect to using secrets appropriately so that you can actually access the repositories and other, other secrets to access databases, and also with respect to Docker build itself not being fast enough. So we went ahead and actually built something, uh, we call it U-Build Engine, which actually optimizes the layer generation. When your Docker build is a bunch of layers of tar files, we actually optimize the layer generation by more efficient scanning of the file system than by relying on the Docker build. And because we have this uh, better technology where we look at the intermediate layers, we actually have a distributed uh, cache for all of these layers that are generated. Why is the cache, and especially distributed cache, important? If you're running 4,000 builds per day, you're not going to build it on one machine. We have a lot of machines which are churning out these builds. When all of these machines are churning out the builds, a lot of these have common, like, Node.js services, all of them have NPM in them. All of the Go language services have some of the common libraries. And all of the Java has JVM. So when you look at all of these layers that are built, they're pretty common across different services. But then we need to figure out how to make use of cache, like layers that are built on one machine on other machines. This really helps a lot in our speed, uh, speeding up our time 
and we cut down from using a standard Docker build to our build, the time in about half. And we've managed to actually make the image size sizes even smaller. And I'll come to the next slide where I explain why this thing is important. This is key because when we look at deploying these builds that we build, they go out to a lot of machines. We have a registry from which many services are pulling thousands of instances on thousands of machines when we have a new upgrade. The largest one is actually more than 10,000 instances, but we have a long tail of like hundreds of, insta hundreds of instances and many with thousands. What happens is like, you know, like we talk about boot storms in typical VMs. The same thing happens in containers. Like you deploy 1,000 instances, they're all trying to pull the new image from the registry, it just keels over. There are different ways to solve this problem. One is find the biggest machine, most memory, fastest SSDs, like largest capacity, and throw it at the problem. We did that. It wasn't enough. We do horizontal scaling. We put in a lot of registries where you push to all of them, then try to pull, up, pull all of them. We actually, we do this too. We, we did both. <laughs> But we, interestingly, there's a like, lot of additional problems that happen with horizontal scaling that we had to solve. For example, if you have uh, registries in multiple data centers, when do you start your deployment? Do you push to one data center, start deploying there, or do you wait for all data centers to have the replicas of the registry before you start deploying? Like, do you serialize everything? Do you try to optimize? There's a lot of different interesting challenges that we had to solve. In addition to this, what we did, this wasn't enough. Both the horizontal scaling and the vertical scaling wasn't enough for Uber because of the number of instances that we're deploying every, every day. So what we did was we built a project called Kraken, which does some level of horizontal and vertical scaling. And then it actually relies on P2P distribution of all of these images. So we actually scale now with the load. So once you have thousands of instances, what you could do is some number of machines download from the original registries, and then the rest of the distribution actually happens where we actually chunk up the image into different blobs, and the blobs are actually exchanged with like a BitTorrent style protocol between all of the machines. Now, as we scale the clusters, we don't have to worry about scaling the registry because the seeds in the cluster actually propagate the image much faster. This has actually helped us solve a lot of the bottlenecks. Now, we actually, is, this is a visualization of an example image that was distributed, which was taking a few minutes before, and now with uh, Kraken, just goes out in a few seconds. We have a talk coming up at Mesoscon next month about uh, Kraken, and we'll soon work on a blog post and also open source it. Even the previous uh, build engine that we talked about, we are working on a blog post, it's in draft stage. We are also working on open sourcing it. It has some similarities to the Google, I think, Kaniko project, but we realized that we started around the same time, but we also had to solve some additional challenges. It will definitely be an interesting project which is useful for others. And one of the, one of the important things that we think about is when we are solving these problems, how does it work for when we open source this to solve problems of companies which don't have the same scale. This is an interesting debate that we have internally, and one of the questions like, I asked the team was, oh, the build engine, like, is it only useful for large web scale companies? And then we realized that there's benefits to what we did in the build engine, uh, needing, to, uh, needing to have root access to build something, we eliminated that being able to build on a cluster without actually going to a machine with Docker, we solved that problem. Needing to access secrets while mounting uh, something that you need to access from the network, we solved that. So there's a few additional benefits that even companies without scale get from some other technologies that we build. Testing. We, uh, many people know about Black Friday in US, which is the peak traffic for most retailers. For Uber, it's Halloween and New Year. New Year's Eve, exactly. As you can imagine, when 
people are having more fun, they actually want more Uber. <laughs> so that ends up being our peak traffic, but we can't really reproduce that every day, uh, especially at a large scale like ours. And what that results in is the type of issues that happen at scale can't be found in like unit testing or load testing of one service. Because not only the faults don't show up, but also the cascading issues that happen when one service is heavily loaded doesn't show up in the rest of the system. And like we have a philosophy, I mean, these are my words that philosophy, no testy, no worky. Like if you, doesn't matter how well you thought of the design, if you actually haven't tested it, it doesn't work. So we do a lot of different uh, testing frameworks to solve this problem. Hailstorm is our uh, load testing framework where during non-Halloween, non-New Year's Eve time, each of the services can actually subscribe to Hailstorm tests where they get tested up to their peak load that they've specified, whether it's queries per second or whether it's number of transactions, they get tested to that level. And then we can actually, this is in production. So you can actually see the effect, transitive effect of what happens with services that are dependent on the services in production. This is really key because we do this pretty regularly. Hailstorm tests are happening continuously. Whenever there is no load, we actually put the system at load. <laughs> then we have uh, what we call as uDestroy. It is a framework, again, for injecting uh, faults and failures into the system, like standard things like just kill microservices while, you know, while running in production. We also do things like uh, inject latencies on the network path, inject latencies between services. So what this gives us is not just observing systems when they fail, what happens, but when they slow down, what happens. This is a pretty good, uh, useful framework for us. For example, when we wanted to bring up a new data center, and we said, hey, by the way, that data center actually has higher latency, 100 millisecond versus 50 millisecond. We could just like simulate it by using UDestroy framework. And last but not the least, like having all these frameworks doesn't help if you actually don't use them. So we do pretty regular failure and failover drills. Uh, we do similar things like failing a full data center over to another data center. And these are sort of things that expose issues when, if you, like, you know, like Catherine was saying, if you don't test it, it gets stale, and then you find issues that you know, somebody introduced some dependency that you won't find till you actually run the test again. So because we do this regularly, we've actually had a lot of failures that actually were not seen by the end users. This is really, this is, we're really proud of that part of it. Going beyond testing, when we go for actually running these containers, containers are sized for this load that we talked about. So, you know, eight CPU cores, virtual cores, uh, eight gigabytes of memory, or you know, two cores, eight gigabytes of memory. We do a lot of horizontal scaling for addressing uh, scale. So uh, as the load starts going up, you can increase the number of instances because and the design handles scaling number of instances and sharding traffic and everything. But one of the difficult things to do actually is how do you size these units when they're actually not using the resources? So as an example, you say four CPUs and 16 gig of memory, the service most of the time actually using about like two to three percent of the CPU and you know using about a gig of memory. Now this is a, at scale when you have like tens of thousands of servers, a lot of this utilization really means like your machine is sitting idle, of course, other than when you're doing hailstorm tests. So what we have realized is how do you drive this efficiency because this is, this is dollars that we've paid for. And by the way, this is not even cloud, we actually have a lot of on-prem data centers too. So what we have uh, done with some of these resources is we combined some of our responsive and revocable services on the same cluster. As an example, what we do is we take all of our services, we bucket them into tiers. The higher tiers are the ones that need responsive latency whenever you push the button to get a ride versus when you need to send out a billing report, that's a lower tier service that can actually like replay the events from Kafka or something and generate the bills. So what happens now is 
we combine these services to run on the same machine where we actually oversubscribe the resources on the machine. And these oversubscribed resources are what are running the background batch. Some of them are batch. Some of them are actually just low, low tier services itself. These are long running. Now, when you do this over subscription, we said test often. So we start running these services. Cluster utilization goes up. Great. Now you fail over. Now the data center load goes up, and all of these background uh, revocable tasks start getting killed. And you have an outage where you can't generate bills anymore. So these are the sort of things that you design for you squeeze the balloon in one direction, it pops out in the other direction. And this is something that we have to pay attention to. And what we did was, when we do this revocable tasks, we actually go back and we rate limit how often we kill these things. So when we actually are doing a failover, the problem is not the total capacity of the cluster, but temporary spikes that happen as soon as we start something. Because as an, as an interesting nuance, the CPU utilization is not purely because of a service running, but the moment you want to run a service, you pull a Docker image, disk I.O. You decompress it, disk I.O., like you know, CPU and I.O. So those are interesting things that happen where you start trying to run a service that's temporary spikes, but the machine notices that there's a spike and starts killing the revocable tasks. So we have to sort of guard against these temporary spikes by rate limiting how often we kill these revocable things. And these are some, some of the learnings that we did. We start out with, oh, let's improve the utilization. Let's do something. Oh, something fails. Okay. Let's understand what's going on. Oh, we have to rate limit this, uh, what we do with these sort of things. These learnings are pretty common. That's something that we have done across like multiple experiments, just like running. And these influence some of the things that we do now. Now we plan for this upfront in terms of our thinking. About monitoring, we actually have open sourced a metrics platform called M3. Uh, this is also written in Go. Internally, it supports about 5 billion time series, uh, about 10 million metrics per second. These are flowing into the system. And one of the important things about metrics is you build a platform, you build a bunch of services, you start streaming your metrics, you set up alerting based on that. We add a new service. Like, what happens? Oh, what do you have to change? What dashboard do you have to update? What alerts do you have to update? Oh, we bring on a new zone, new region, new cloud. How do you have to update all of these sort of things? And we are definitely bringing up zones frequently enough for this to affect the whole company. And when we are doing this, all of these changes actually result in a lot of churn in what we do with the alerts. So one of the solutions that we have done is instead of people programming alerts, we actually have rule-based alert generators so that a data center becomes another variable that you iterate over and generate the alerts. So no longer alerts are no longer human-written, but they're actually generated by rule generators. Same thing with actually updating these alerts that actually go through a Git flow. So you write the alerts in Git, it gets reviewed by people, and then you push it out. So you don't have to worry about people going to a website, you know, editing the alert, writing the queries, and then confirming that it's written correctly, wait for the actual event to happen, how do you reproduce this? So we actually have a good framework to do this via Git. And we do this when we write all of these alerts and stream it out to a platform, and we write uh, deal with the on-call load that happens when these alerts get generated. We measure the on-call quality in terms of how many alerts are getting generated, how many are actionable, is it noisy, are, they, are engineers annotating the alerts when there's something real that's happening, there are runbooks associated with every alert. What happens with the runbook? Is it actionable? Especially when people who, act, who did not write the original service, they go on call, their input is really valuable. And this is an important aspect because DevOps is a little tricky. Is it the developers who are doing the ops or is it the SRE who've never written the service who are doing the ops? All of these things play into how you decide like, you know, the on-call quality. Because if this on-call quality is not good, 
what's going to happen as the company scales and as the software scales, is you're just going to throw more and more people at the problem. And we can't afford to throw more people at this problem. At our, at our scale, we have to solve it using procedures and processes that help out. Once we have all of these framework running and we have this monitoring, you know, hardware and software has a tendency to have faults, or the more technical term is shit happens. <laughs> once, that, once, it, once that thing happens, you know, Uber, at Uber scale, we generate 100, 100, plus, 100 million plus alerts per month. And this is across the whole stack for all services, for infrastructure and everything. We do not have the people to sort of solve these alerts. There is no way that you can sit and click through and analyze what's going on with each of these alerts. And a lot of these alerts actually are pointing to faults that are transient and temporary. For example, like the most common alert that happens at a host level is host is unpingable. You know, some software issue, some driver issue, and like we have to deal with it. And a lot of, the, lot of these times, like the solution actually is you know, just reboot the thing, you know, just restart the service. And when these sort of solutions are something that you do manually, what you have done is started putting together a framework where we take these alerts, we do smart prioritization, which is this is a low urgency. It can be dealt with offline. It doesn't have to be dealt with a human right away. Whereas some alerts which have to be, and it, sometimes it's the same alert. If you're actually getting a disk full alert on a Docker, Docker host, you might not care when it's just like running services. You just kill the machine, clean, up, clean it up in the background, migrate the services off. If that same thing happens on a Cassandra host, you can't just say like, yeah, you know, move it off. Like, there's a lot of data in there. You can't replicating the data by bringing up a new Cassandra node takes too long. So alerts are meaning not based on just what the alert is, but the context too. So we deal with all of these context plus the alert in figuring out what is the priority for that. And once they're prioritized, we figure out what are these manual tasks that we're doing, and we automate them. So whenever these host is unpingable, alert gets fired, actually goes goes into a database, there's a, manage, there's a cluster manager that is scanning these things, and it goes back, it actually verifies. We've had problems with that too, where something gets registered as unpingable, and you go back, and the machine is actually up, and you, know, you shouldn't have touched it, but you know, we go and touch it. <laughs> so what we actually do is automate some of these tasks where we reboot or restart services just by using that tool. And this reduces a lot of these alert noise, which are actionable by an automated system than manual. You start doing this, you automate the alerts, the world starts rebooting. You don't want that. So that's why we have to do SLA-aware automation. This is the same thing like I said before. What you learn from automation systems, this time we actually put in these guards up front. So you do not reboot too many hosts in the same time window. We haven't solved a full SLA-aware for each service, but that is something that we're working on where when we are actually looking at hosts and servers and services, we map to make sure that a given service, wherever it's running, we don't actually reboot hosts for that service, as opposed to generally like not rebooting hosts across the cluster. So SLA awareness is a very key thing when we, when we do this. We talked about, we call that auto-remediation, self-healing, whatever, whatever different terminology for how systems fix themselves. We, do, we try to do this across the whole cluster. We try to do auto-provisioning where with you know, as few clicks, you can actually provision machines into the cluster. And actually, the system that decided that it's going to shut down or reboot or RMA a machine, that, that same system can actually take some of the standby machines and inject it into the cluster. That way, you're automatically remedying this thing. And by the way, this, hap this happens to be different on on-prem data centers versus the cloud. It's similar, you bring up a new EC2 VM or a, something else that runs the same stack inside, versus an on-prem data center, we actually need spares to be around. The same thing with respect to deployment tools, configuration, scale, how do you order scale instances when the load starts going up? How do you update, update both the services and the config? How do you detect these issues that are, that are happening? When you actually rely on alerts that are being written, we have a pretty strict uh, review of whenever you're rolling out a new system and does it have enough 
alerts and other mechanisms that are actually already added so that the new service, whenever it comes online into production, when something goes wrong, it's detectable. We don't rely on service went bad, why, what, what did we not have? So what are some of the learnings rounding this up, right? You've seen some of these patterns in the existing things that I already talked about. One is uh, Uber, we do standards-based innovation. Let me, t let me sort of explain what is standards-based innovation. The projects that we do that address our problems in terms of scale and other issues, what we do is we try to stay within the envelope of trying to use standard interfaces, standard definitions, open protocols. So for example, the same build stuff that we did, we did not go out and invent a new build format. Some companies have actually done that, which makes their job easier. But we've decided to stay within the Docker image format, except try to innovate within that umbrella. Same thing with the Kraken project. It's actually a pretty generic blob store that can distribute blobs around the data center. And we use it for both configuration and images. But the interface it implements actually is a Docker registry API. So you can actually talk to it using a standard registry API rather than having to write some other custom layer. So when it's running on a machine, if you actually go and try to do the same Docker pull, it would just work. That's the basic idea. Layer cake architecture. This is one of the things I think someone in the audience asked in the previous talk about what are the learnings about how to do microservices. This applies both to infrastructure and all the different services that we build. And this is, this again, it might in hindsight, like you know, hindsight is 2020, but this is something that we've learned is when you build infrastructure, when you build software services, build it in layers where there is no dependency of a lower layer on a higher layer. This gets violated very often. This gets violated very often in most software. And we've tried to apply this principle now during the design phase, during the review phase, when you're looking at code, you sort of keep, you know, pay attention to this layer cake architecture where you're allowed to go from a higher layer to a lower layer, but never the other way. And this automatically avoids something which I talk about like, you know, cyclic dependencies. When you start having cyclic dependencies, the whole distributed systems and microservices at scale starts breaking down pretty fast because one service starts having load, starts you know, having IO failures or transaction failures, it sort of ripples around and if it actually, if there is a cyclic dependency, then bad stuff happens. The same thing with respect to cascading failures. We talked, like, you know, as an example, we, you know, we talked about retry failures in the previous talk, right? The same sort of a thing. When you have failures in one system, you have to sort of limit how much you propagate to each of these layers. And either you use fallback mechanisms or you use, like, you know, standard errors where you basically say, okay, it has failed and don't retry, as opposed to, okay, this is a retriable error. So when you start building that concept into the service itself, saying, this is a temporary failure, please ask me again, versus this is a permanent failure, don't bother me. These sort of things actually influence what happens when your system starts running in production. But you have to design this upfront when you're building the service. Incremental deployments, this is you know, tried and tested CI, CD. I don't have to say this to this audience. We do incremental deployments where we do 5%, 15%, 50%, 20% sort of rollouts. We wait for all the metrics to be stable. The metrics have to be accurate. And this is done both for code and config. And we have ways to quickly roll back any of the config that we roll out also, so that you know, the moment metrics show any issue, we can go back to the previous configuration. And, lo and this is sort of uh, throughout the stack. We have an experimentation platform that's across the company that is used to do these sort of things in a standard way so that we don't have a problem with one service doing it in one way and another service doing it in another way. And these are some of the things we have to sort of build at the right time. You can't do it too early when you have like, you know, when you're building four microservices. You can't do it when you're running 3,000 microservices. You sort of find the time early enough to make sure you're injecting these thoughts and frameworks early enough 
the life cycle of your product. Test often, including production. And this is one thing that actually for us, uh, we have a harder time trying to figure out how to test like outside production. Unit testing doesn't help. Scale testing, load testing, performance testing, all of the frameworks that we use are still not enough because what we do in production, I think we don't catch it in unit testing as much. We try to learn from each of these. We try to learn from every outage. We try to learn from every issue that happens to go back and like improve our testing. And adding guardrails to automation. Automation is cool. Automation is fun. Automation, you know, everyone loves automation. But in our experience, we have to add guardrails so that you're not doing too much automation. Systems are not running amok, trying to reboot stuff, kill services, you know, clean up databases, delete files on, you know, disks. This, this, you know, this sort of, you have to sort of make sure you put enough guard against it. And design for understandability. I want to go a little bit deeper on this topic, just in a slide. So this is something that, you know, in hindsight seems obvious, but I want to talk about it anyway. When you're building systems, it, systems start out small. The small system, it fits in somebody's brain. One person, one team, it's sort of manageable. As systems get more complex, what happens is the system gets larger, there are more and more moving pieces, and every change that anyone does has a bigger impact. They're all interconnected. You do a tweak there, you don't understand the code, you break an assumption, you don't deal with an exception, the whole, stacks, the whole stack fails down. Now there's more people, more teams, 3,000 microservices, 3,000 developers. No single person can actually fit everything into the, I can't, nobody in, I guarantee you, nobody, nobody at Uber can fit all of this architecture in their brain and explain it. And when you do this, what happens? You have larger teams, and the less each person knows. It's actually worse than having a monolith with one person understanding everything or a team understanding everything. Because now each person only knows a piece of the thing and they're making changes and they're breaking stuff. And this is key because our understanding of systems actually breaks down more often than the actual systems break. This is, this is proven and like to answer one of the questions, we've had outages, actually we, have, we haven't had outages, we had issues where a whole data center lost power, no customer knew. We had an individual try to delete some legacy code. We had a public 20 minute outage earlier this year. So those are, when you build systems, sometimes like you know, the actual building of systems which handles physical issues, power issues, machines dying, databases crashing, all of these sort of things work. But when people are involved, if you don't understand the system and you make changes, it actually causes more damage. And this, you know, I've seen it in practice. <laughs> I'll leave you with that, and we are hiring too, <laughs> just like Pragma. <laughs> <laughs>